uh, ladies and gentlemen, a preamble uh, for those who don't know, uh, Jim Florentine, um, aka Jazz and Jim, was a DJ uh, back in the sort of 1990s era. Uh, there was this uh, TV thing called MTV, and they hired him to do things like um, interview shitty college kids on spring break, uh, phone, uh, make prank phone calls where he'd pretend to be someone with Down syndrome as well as be an opening act for music bands. Now, he would have done this for the rest of his life, but uh, MTV kind of faded out. So uh, Florentine would go on the road, a road comic, and he would, of course, do uh, radio programs. And occasionally, I guess he was leaving his uh, uh, show no prep notes of what he wanted to talk about. He would leave them behind in the green room or hallways. So that's how we got here. Uh, names and places may have been uh, changed to protect the identity of the uh, victims. Okay, let's go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to a special presentation, a narration of the Jim Florentine Lost Papers. Yes, that's right, the Lost Show Note Papers. Um, some of these have been found in the hallways of Sirius XFM, and others have been uh, found in various radio station uh, desks after he was gone. Um, anthropologists have noted that most of them have been written in a uh, uh, big pen blue, uh, some on uh, legal yellow legal pad notes, uh, and others, at least one, written on the back of what appears to be a Jim Florentine uh, promotional poster, which had been cut up and was being used as scrap paper. Um, I hope you'll enjoy the, our reading tonight of the Jim Florentine Lost Show Notes. Curated from Notes Number 3, in preparation for O&A, December. Talk about... Well, this could be self-instructions, or, I don't know, possibly a title. Yeah, so this one time, Jim and I were doing a gig in Princeton. Remember that? Magoobies? Yeah, so we met these uh, fucking chicks after the show, and they were really hot. And they wanted to fuck us, so we offered to drive them home. And once we got going on the road, one of them pulls out a fucking pound of coke, and we just start doing it. I'm driving, and she's slamming fucking line after line. Then she gets on top of me and starts fucking me while I'm driving and making me do lines off of her tits. By the time we're halfway there, I'm so fucking high I can't see the road, so I'm just trying to concentrate. Then I look back, and there's Norton giving one of the fucking rods a blowjob. So I'm on a bag of coke, and she's riding me, and this is in addition to the three hits of acid I took earlier that night. Actually, four if you count the one I took in the morning. Norton then starts saying that he needs to take a shit. And we pull over, and I'm relieved, because I need to sober up so the cops don't see me weaving and shit. And soon, I want to take a shit, too. So we're both squatting on the side of the road. I look up, and this fucking bus drives by. And there we are, just squatting and shitting. And the coke powder is all over our face. The bus slows down. Uh, we can't stop shitting because we're on coke, so... We stare as the window rolls down, and there's fucking Brad Padlin, lead singer of the Wombats, just looks at us and yells, Fucking pussies! He waits, rolls the windows back up, and drives off. We were so high, we didn't notice that the broads we were fucking had run off into the bus and probably just wanted to give Padlin blowjobs. Anyway, I will always remember that. Duration number two, found on the desk of a radio station. There was this one time at Battle of the Bands that took place there in fucking where? Jersey. The fucking Jersey Dome. That's fucking demolished now, and it's a Cinnabon. But back then it was fucking huge. Uh, like, that was like in 88. And the Battle of the Bands thing was huge. So I'm opening, and it's like fucking madness and it's fucking still open seating back then. Well, they don't do that anymore after so many trampling accidents. So I'm like on stage, and they're throwing fucking anything at me. Fucking glass bottles, Zippos, and I'm dodging. Then one bottle bounces off my shoulder, and I'm like, fuck. And then I look down, and in the front row of this fucking broad with the biggest tits I ever saw, 
says something, and throws what I think is a fucking softball or something, but it's a huge ball of coke. So I catch it, and I just start doing the coke on stage. And now the crowd is all behind me, and they're fucking cheering so loud, I didn't notice the big-titted broad got up on stage and is now sucking my cock in front of everybody. We go backstage, and I try to find a room so I can fuck this broad. And when I open a backstage door, guess who's there? Fucking Lenny McLean, drummer for the Death Racers. He's just fucking standing there. And I'm like, what the fuck? And he pulls us in and says, Kid, if you're going to have to learn one thing or the other, you got to know you can do blow or you can get blown, but never at the same time. I will always remember that. From curation number two. I remember this one time I was at Funkin' Woodstock too, and if you remember, that was the one with Funkin' what's his name, Mark Learman, lead guitarist for A Thousand Snakes. He was so pissed because he fucking signed on, but I didn't realize, and neither did he, it was a three day festival. So he was fucking bored and he'd sit in his trailer all day doing blow and acid and asked me to do it with him. I'm like, okay, but I'd already done six beers that morning and a hit of acid. So I'm already buzzed, and he's like, here, try this. And it's a fucking chunk of fucking ecstasy. But like, not like a pill or shit, but like, imagine like a chunk of drywall you'd pulled off a wall or something. I can't eat it because it tastes like shit to chew, so he gives me a bottle of fucking 90% vodka to chase it down. That's when he tells me the ecstasy was fucking pure and soaked in acid. And he wasn't kidding, because 20 minutes later, I could barely talk. And Learman says to me, Hey, what's a festival without getting high? And I look over and there's this fucking naked broad sucking on his cock. So I'm high and I don't even notice. But now I'm fucking her up the ass. The next thing I know, I got three minutes to get on stage. So there I am running. I get on stage and hear this from the crowd. Dude, your fucking fly is undone. And I look down like, what? And my zipper... Still was fucking halfway down from fucking that hooker up the ass. Talk about embarrassing moments. Yeah, if you watch the VHS tape recordings I have at home, you can actually see my zipper is like halfway down. But it's not noticeable because her feces was smeared all over that part of my pants. I'll never forget that. Jim Florentine. From curation number one, found on the bottom of a radio station's bathroom floor. This other time, Funkin' Norton and I were opening for Grand Wizards, remember that, in Poughkeepsie? But that's before Jeff Marsh, you know, he was the lead guitarist, so... Okay, so that was before their third album, Space, came out. Uh, so they weren't that big yet, but they were still pretty popular. So that's before Gordon Lease took over as the lead guitarist. No, wait, that was after that, because Lise actually did sing on that second album, and I think that they still had Jeff Slang drumming, but whatever it was, Marsh is who was sitting in the green room when we show up, and he's already finishing a big bottle of gin, and he offers some, but we'd already drank a bottle of vodka and some fucking pills, so we tried to say, nah, -uh, but then he turns to Norton and says, what's with that Florentine? Is he on the wagon? And then Jim says, nah, it's not that, it's just that he's a pussy. And I'm like, fuck both of you. And I grab this bottle of gin sitting there and start chugging and chugging. Then fucking Marsh, like this is before their third album came out in 91. He's chanting like, chug, chug, chug. And I down the whole bottle and suddenly lead singer Ben Cramplin, the lead singer of the Crows, who was opening for Grand Wizards, he comes in looks at me, Norton and Marsh, and says, Fuck, I got a dead prostitute in my green room. Does anyone have a shovel? I'll never forget he said that, because it was only two weeks after the Crows replaced uh, their bassist fucking, what's his name? Uh, oh yeah, Bon Molly. They, they replaced him with Barry Scott, which was just, that's just before their second album was coming out. So, that's why I'll never forget that. From curation number four, found in an ONA Sirius XM uh, green room. This one time, we were on a fucking MTV spring break, 
and that's back in the MTV days. That's the one where they did Cancun, and that was like the easiest gig because all I only had to do was some interviews in the afternoons and walk around and all these uh, fucking college kids were handing me beer, weed, acid, and ecstasy was pretty much legal in Mexico at the time, so we were just eating those like candies. And by noon, I'm already on my 28th beer and snorting lines off this fucking college girl's tits by the pool. The producers, well, they tell me they want to do some fucking extra shit for like background shots or something. So I'm like, who cares? I figure that I'll just do these three lines off her tits and then quickly chug down my 30th beer. And I figure the ecstasy will keep me alert and I swallow them like a handful of them. Uh, by the time I get to the shoot, I'm fucking buzzing. And all I'm supposed to do is, like, walk up and down the beach. You know, they film it for splicing in later. So while I'm doing that, I look over, and I swear there's this fucking merman or some shit. Like a, like a fucking giant sea creature thing, but, like, with human legs. And, and it's coming at me. I mean, I, I swear to you, it looked as real as I'm looking at fucking Bob Kelly here. I mean, like, it wasn't as fat, but you know what I mean. So I start fucking panicking because the fucking monster looks so real and it's coming at me. I take my microphone and sort of hold it like you would a knife. And I do start slamming the fucking blunt end into this fucking sea creature thing. And just like over and over just hammering it in. And finally some fucking Mexican security guard or something comes over and he grabs me. I don't know if he was Mexican, but he hits me with a taser. And I don't feel a thing because I just keep slamming my microphone so hard. It breaks, and now I don't realize it was the sharp plastic. It was now gashing the shit out of this thing. I just remember blacking out and waking up in this fucking room like, what, where the fuck am I? I look over and there's Shannon Watts, our producer, and her whole face is fucking bandaged up and bloody and shit. And she says, why, why did you do this to me? And starts crying and fucking shit. Later, I realized that she was the one I was hallucinating and shit, and that's when it hit me. Oh, fuck. Someone must have dosed me, and I think probably when I was snorting coke off that chick's tits by the pool, I suspect somebody put something in my fucking beer. So, after that, I keep a close eye on my drink. I never let it out of my sight, especially if I'm in Cancun. Well, anyway, that's why I'll never forget that. Our next is from show notes left behind at the now defunct most offensive podcast on earth. Things to talk about. Again, not sure if that's a title or instructions to himself. This one time at Rams camp, like that's back in 2002, like when they'd replaced, you know, Jerry Moon as quarterback and they'd fucking signed Continent Walker. So they invited me to training camp to do this fucking promo thing or whatever. So I'm psyched because the Rams were on my fantasy football that year, like for an 8th place finish, but that's also because I didn't know Alron was coming back that year. Like, nobody knew, so it's not just me that didn't know that. I get there and uh, it's fucking Al Breezerman himself. He shows up and I'm like, fucking wow, because he's probably my favorite GM besides GM Bryn Zellman. So I'm like, holy shit, this is my chance to meet him and I gotta get a photo with him. But he says... Hey, I know you. My son watches you on MTV, and he says you're really funny. And I'll never forget he said that. That's why I felt a little bad after I was fucking his wife in her mouth in the locker room that night. But that's after I did 40 beers and a bag of Coke, so I wasn't really thinking straight. But I felt kind of bad, because her husband is still one of my favorite GMs. Well, or he was back when they signed Marvis Frangle, but that was an insane trade for tight end Jackson Regal. And like, what the fuck were they thinking with that trade? So anyway, I didn't feel so bad about coming in her mouth, but... Oh, God, jeez, really? So then I didn't feel so bad about doing that to his wife. But the thing is, he said his kid liked me, and I'll never forget that. Jim Florentine. From the show notes found outside a green room on his latest night TV show appearance, uh, these are incomplete, but we will read them as they were found. Dear Penthouse, I am a freshman at a Midwestern college, and until recently I never believed the stories in Penthouse Forum to be true, that is, until last Saturday. 
I was in my dorm room when suddenly there was a knock at my door. I opened it to see three co-eds, 34, 24, 35, 34, 24, 36. Before I could say anything, suddenly they knelt down and engulfed my nine-inch rock-hard tool in their mouth. Then one of them said to me, hurry up and fuck all of us. I'll never forget they said that, because that had always been a fantasy of mine, until it came true. Jim Florentine.